Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be solving a torsion function inequality. So we're supposed to find the smallest integer such that phi of n divided by n is less than 0 0.2. So let's go ahead and define the torsion function which is also called Euler's torsion function and we use the Greek letter phi to represent that. Let's go ahead and define that first. So phi of n is defined as the number, number, of positive integers up to n, which means that, uh, you know, numbers that are less than or equal to n, that are relatively prime to n. That are relatively prime to n. And I'll give you some examples. So, Basically, what we're trying to do here is let's take a number like 6, for example, right? How do you find phi of 6? Well, let's go ahead and look at all the numbers that are less than or equal to 6 first, right? What are them? What are they? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, we're going to compare these numbers to 6. So we're going to be finding their GCD with 6. And then if that GCD is 1, then we're going to count them. All right? So let's go ahead and take a look. For example, 1. 1 and 6 are obviously relatively prime, right? So we're going to count 1. 2 and 6 are not relatively prime, so 2 is not going to count. 3 is not going to count. 4 is not going to count. But 5 is going to count. What about 6 and 6? Well, it's not going to count because 6 and 6 have a common divisor of 6 itself. So there's only two numbers that are relatively prime to 6. So the answer would be 2 then. So phi of 6 is equal to 2. So it's just a number that counts these uh, specific numbers. All right? But how do you find it and what are some of the important facts about phi of n? Let's talk about them right now. And then we're going to get into the solution of the problem. All right, cool. So since phi of n is going to count the number of positive integers that are relatively prime to n, we can safely say that if p is a prime number, then we can safely say that phi of p is always going to be p minus 1 if p is prime. Now, why is that true? Because if you think about it, a prime number, pretty much everything less than that prime number is going to be relatively prime to that prime number because prime numbers only have two divisors, 1 and itself, right? And of course, a prime number and 1 are also relatively prime, so it's going to count. The only thing that doesn't count is p in this case, so we have to subtract 1. Make sense? Now, of course, we can come up with so many other features, but let's go ahead and talk about one more thing, which is super duper important. What if you have the power of a prime? Now, if you have the power of a prime, you've got to think about this, like write all the numbers 1 through p to the power n, and then take out the numbers that are not relatively prime to p to the power n, which are multiples of p. And how many of them do we have? p to the power n minus 1. Therefore, phi of p to the power n should equal p to the power n minus p to the power n minus 1, if, again, p is prime. All right, cool. Now, the torsion function is actually a very interesting function in number theory because it's multiplicative, just like the d of n or the sigma of n. Remember, we had a problem about the sigma, which I'll probably link in the description below. Okay, cool. So what it means for a function to be multiplicative is if you have two numbers like m and n that are relatively prime, then we can safely say that phi of m times n is equal to phi of m multiplied by phi of n. Of course, we're talking about two numbers that are relatively prime, so we have to write that their GCD is equal to 1. Now, this is really cool because if you have a number that is composite, you can break it down into its prime factors and then uh, write them separately for each prime because, as you know, the two different prime num uh, powers are always going to be relatively prime. For example, 2 to the 7th power and 5 to the 10th power. They're always going to be relatively prime. Okay, this is pretty much what the essence of the torsion function is because that's the formula I'm going to use in this solution. Okay, so one more time, this means that phi is multiplicative. All right, great. Now, how do we find the phi of any number, right? So we talked about phi of 6, we can talk about other numbers, but obviously it's not very practical if you try to list all the numbers and count them, right? So that should be an easier way. Well, it comes from the fact uh, of number... Here we wrote three facts, so we can say pretty much uh, number two and number three. Of course, number two, number one is a special case of number two, because if you replace n with one, then you'll basically be getting what I'm talking about. So what happens is, 
imagine you have a, pr a number that is prime. So, well, not necessarily prime, but it's a product of prime powers. Okay, so something like uh, p to the power, let's say n, and then q to the power m, such, uh, such that p and q are prime numbers. Now, when you're trying to find the phi of this number, obviously what you're going to do is you're going to separate them because these two are relatively prime. So you can safely say that this is equal to phi, to phi of p to the power n multiplied by phi of q to the power m. And then for each one, if you use the formula, it's going to be p to the power n minus p to the power n minus 1 multiplied by q to the power m minus q to the power m minus 1. Okay, now, what you can do with each of these is, for example, let's go ahead and take p to the power n minus p to the power n minus 1. One of the things that I can do is I can actually pull p to the power n out, right? So what happens if I factor out p to the power n? Then I, I should be getting something like 1 minus p to the power negative 1, which I can write as 1 over p. So you can do this for all primes, and then when you multiply these together, obviously, you're going to get the phi of the number, right? So for example, for our case, we're going to be getting something like for this number, for this particular number, let's call that capital N. So phi of capital N is going to equal, in this case, p to the power n times 1 minus 1 over p times q to the power m times 1 minus 1 over q. Notice that p and q are distinct primes here. Okay, and if you put it together in a different way, so it's going to be p to the power n times q to the power m, and then multiply by 1 minus 1 over p times 1 minus 1 over q. And this is the critical part. So now, if you're trying to find the phi of a number, basically, wow, notice that what we got here is actually the number capital N itself, right? Isn't that interesting? So if you're trying to find the phi of a number, you've got to take the n and then multiply it by... 1 minus 1 over p, 1 minus 1 over q, whatever the prime numbers are. Of course, in this case, we only have p and q, but you can generalize this for more primes. Now, let's go back to our original problem where we used the lowercase n, but I used lowercase n for something else, but let's go ahead and change the variables again. So our number is basically going to be like this. Phi of n is going to be the lower n times the primes. Now, we don't know how many primes n has, right? We're trying to solve for it. So you can safely say that it's going to look like something like this, 1 minus 1 over p1, 1 minus 1 over p2, so on and so forth, where p1, p2, dot, 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 are all primes. Or if you want, you can write it in a more compact form using this pi symbol for multiplication. You can safely say something like n times, so phi of n can be written as n times pi, i equals 1 through k, k where k is the number of distinct primes, right? And then you can just write it as 1 minus 1 over pi, right? This is basically going to give you all those products in that format. Now, if you apply this to our problem, then let's see what happens. Now, we have, we're given that phi of n divided by n is less than 0 0.2, which I can write as 1 fifth. So basically what I want is, I want this ratio to be less than 1 fifth. And I'm looking for, if you remember the original question, I think I wrote it there. Um, the original first page, we're looking for the smallest integer that satisfies it because why? You're going to notice in a little bit why I'm asking for the smallest one. Okay, now, what do we do with this? Well, if you look at this equation carefully, or the top one, doesn't really matter, they're the same, you'll notice that if you divide both sides by n, you're just going to get the products, right, the, without the n. So basically, we're trying to say that, okay, I, you do have a product like this, 1 minus 1 over p1, multiply by 1 minus 1 over p2. Since this is more friendly than the pi symbol, I'm just going to write it this way. And whatever, wherever it ends, we don't know where, so let's just call that pk. And we want this to be less than 1 fifth, all right? And we're looking for the smallest number that satisfies it. Now, you'll notice why I say the smallest number. So let's go ahead and look at some examples. For example, what kind of number can n be? Can n be uh, the product of so many primes? Do they all have to be distinct? Can I have prime powers? Well, since we're looking for the smallest number, I would probably want to keep my primes to the first power. So let's go ahead and keep every pi or pk, whatever, to the first power. So think of a number like 2, right? What about I consider this term? 1 over, and in this case, p1 is going to be 2, so I can just go ahead and write it that way. So what is 1 minus 1 half? It's, a, it's, it's equal to 1 half, right? What if I also include the 2 and the 3? 
So then I'm getting a product. Let's take a look at this one. Now notice that when I multiply this, this is going to be one half times two thirds, which is equal to one third. Notice that the product is getting smaller. Is this always the case? Yep, that's right. Why? Because every time you're multiplying by a number that's less than one, so this product is going to get smaller and smaller. That's why I ask for the smallest integer because once you get that, you're going to be, that's going to be the answer. Obviously, you can get much larger numbers that satisfy this inequality. Okay. Well, now what about this one? Well, you know that this is equal to one third. So this is going to be one third multiplied by four fifths, which I can write as four over 15. Now take a look at this. None of these numbers are actually less than one fifth, right? They're all larger than one fifth. So we still didn't get there. But notice that the product is getting smaller and smaller. So if I use enough primes, then I'll get my answer. Why am I not using the two or three or five twice or more than two, two times, right? Well, because that's just gonna make my n larger and I want to find the smallest integer. So there's no difference um, between finding something like the phi of two to the second times three to the fifth and phi of two times three. Because if you multiply it by n, you're gonna be getting the same thing because you're only concerned with the primes, right? Not the number itself. Great, so that's for that purpose, I'm only gonna use them to the first powers. Cool, now, what am I gonna do with this? Well, I still haven't gotten to uh, the number that is less than one fifth. So what am I gonna do? I just have to continue to multiply. And let's just call it an ex expand a little bit more so that we don't have to test every single number. So how about we continue with this pattern and I'm just, I'm just gonna keep writing, okay? I'm gonna use one, seven, I'm gonna use 11. Maybe this is gonna be enough, right? Because I wrote a lot of numbers, what do you think? Okay, now, let's see what happens. This is one half, this is two thirds, this is four fifths, this is six over seven, and this is 10 over 11. Okay, cool. Now let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit so we can use cross canceling. Well, three goes into six twice, and then five goes into 10 twice, so we got 16 over 77. Now notice that 16 over 77 is greater than 16 over 80, right? Which is equal to one fifth. So our number is still not less than one fifth. What am I gonna do? Add another prime and let's see if we can include 13 in the product. And notice that since we already have an answer for this, I don't really have to go you know, to great detail because I already have the product for up to 11, right? So what I need to do is then just take the 16 over 77 and multiply it by 12 over 13. And that product is gonna give me what? Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Well, 16 times 12 is 192 and 77 times 13 is a very interesting number. It is going to be 1001. Now notice that if you divide 192 by 1000, you're gonna get 0 0.192, which is already less than one fifth. And if you divide it by a larger number, it's gonna be even less than that. So definitely this is going to be a good candidate. I say candidate because is that the only answer or is that the smallest one? Absolutely. Why? Because I couldn't find a smaller number. And if I go larger, it's not gonna be the smallest. So that's it. But what is n? Well, n is composed of all these primes. What is that? Let's go ahead and write it down. Well, n can be written as the product of all these primes, but remember what I said earlier, you're gonna use each prime to the first power to keep the number smallest. So n is equal to two times, three times, five times, seven times, 11 times 13. And if you go ahead and multiply all these numbers, you're going to get 30,030 as our answer. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow at the same time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.